Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whichever is appropriate in your part of the world. Uh, my name is Chatterf Menard, Design Director in the North Detroit office. I'm very pleased to welcome you to the sixth lecture of our 2021 NORED series. I had a little bit of an opportunity last week uh, to get a preview of today's lecture, and I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, a shout out to our NORD team in our 13 worldwide offices. In Canada, we have Toronto, Ottawa, Calgary, and Edmonton. In the US, yeah, Philadelphia, Detroit, Chicago, and Sacramento. And finally, in the UK, London, Cambridge, Newcastle, Glasgow, and Inverness. We are all coming together for an important part of our ongoing efforts to bring the best talents of a global team to bear on the recent issues facing our clients. NORED is making an effort this year not only to break down the barriers within our own firm, but to reach out to our colleagues in the industry, at the universities, and at the universities that are preparing the next generation of architectural, engineering, and interior design professionals. Today, I'd like to recognize in Canada, the University of Calgary, the University of Waterloo, the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada Syllabus Program, and the University of Windsor, as well, Drexel University, Temple University, in Philadelphia, Lawrence Technological University in Detroit, Roma Trey University in Italy, and the University of Dundee in Scotland. We want to extend a warm welcome to the students and faculty joining us today. We hope you enjoy and spread the word. For those that need AIA credits, we will send information to attendees in the near future that will provide information for self-reporting. And finally, uh, the previous two years of NORED sessions will be available through NORED YouTube and it will be available soon. This is yet another contribution NOR is making towards continuing education in architecture and engineering. Now I'd like to introduce the chairman of NOR, Silvio Valdesera, to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Chad. Uh, welcome to the um, October um, 6th session uh, today. The uh, next slide, please. And the October is the month of Advanced Building Skin Conference and Exhibition in Bern, Switzerland. 2021 marks the um, event's 16th year and is being held on the 21st of October. The world gathers to understand the phenomenon of how architects design the latest and the most sophisticated high performance and complex building skins in the world and how the industry implements them. Um, but is this just hype or is it real? And as, will we see these buildings lasting uh, as long as the ones from the past? When I was learning to be an architect, the chief draftsman uh, in the corner of the office that I worked in drew all of the details and we drafted them. And I guess that was the uh, NORED at the time. Then the book behind me just over to my right, the AIA Architectural Graphic Standards was always on the uh, drafting table. And uh, it was the Bible that uh, we used as the standards and working drawing details. Um, that was uh, there until um, uh, most of us um, uh, uh, retired. Then the internet came along and everybody who had access grabbed standards and details from the most exotic materials from wherever uh, being used. No matter whether they were being used in Florida, Edmonton, Chicago, Dubai, um, they were always um, uh, used in buildings regardless of where they were. But there was very little consideration given to vapor barriers, flashing, rain screen, insulation. It was all the same thing, I guess. Uh, today, I think the industry is out of control. Anyone who can copy shop drawings from the internet can grab them from anywhere in the world, whether or not it makes any sense as to where you're actually building. The building that you're looking at on the screen right now is Mikado Silvetti's uh, Center for Asian Art Museum. Uh, is a perfect example. It's a great architectural solution, but is it the kind of solution that you would transpose directly to Edmonton, Alberta? And is it the kind of skin that would actually perform there? Over the past 50 years, clients, developers, governments are being seduced with the glossy magazines that 
we see everywhere. And understandably so to put those cities on the map. But in the words of my and our in-house counsel's favorite legal movie of all time, My Cousin Vinny, does it hold water? That is the question that our insurance policies worldwide have um, seen uncontrolled um, for the past little while, the claims that are coming in. Forensics Building Envelope Consultant reports ultimately determine the failure with a lot of the buildings that we're seeing in the industry today. So could this have been avoided? Maybe, and perhaps through education, um, we could have changed a lot of what we are uh, seeing today. So we're here today uh, to listen to John Straub. Next slide, please. The Tower of Babel. Uh, the presentation will explore the design philosophy and construction technology of building enclosure skins by considering historic, the past, approaches, its development, and new philosophies and materials currently popular, and the changes. And I won't go through the entire description that's written here. It was, was issued, and most of you hopefully have read it. But in talking to John, what we really wanted to do in this presentation is to look at the experiences in Canada, in the USA, and the UK, the areas that are close to the NOR offices. And what I will do is, is read the learning objectives, which are important uh, for those of you are, who are looking for accreditation. And that is list the key enclosure performance requirements, understand the different enclosure re related terms, language and jargon in English speaking world, explain the concept of the perfect wall design paradigm and describe the differences between traditional enclosure and the modern system. The next slide, please. John Straub is the Associate Professor of the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Waterloo. And he shares his time between architecture and the Department of Civil Engineering there. He's the author or co-author of over 11 published technical papers, author of Book of High Performance Enclosures and co-author with Eric Burnett of building science, uh, building enclosures. John Straub's leadership as a building scientist and an educator has been recognized with multiple awards, including Lifetime Achievement Award in Building Science Education from the National Consortium Housing Research Center. As the principal of RDH Building Sciences and RDH Building Science Labs, he conducts forensics investigations, as I said previously um, uh, to you. John Straub is one of the, you know, the, the people that certainly us at NOR have relied on um, uh, for, for a very long time, for decades, to not only assist us on, on projects, but, but, but help us in looking at buildings and, and building um, building envelopes. And today we are fortunate to have him as our guest speaker. And I'll turn this over to our friend, John Straw. Thank you, Silvio. You know, it occurs to me that, yeah, we've worked together the first time was so long ago that I can't believe you hired me because I really didn't know anything. Uh, but I guess uh, we, we, we both know more now than we did know then. <laughs> So I'm going to uh, dig into those, some of those juicy topics that Silvio outlined. And as I was putting together the slide set, um, the abstract, which seemed like a great idea at the time, meant that I needed like, you know, maybe six or eight hours to do a decent job. So obviously, I'm going to focus in on certain aspects and um, try to as much create awareness uh, because there's lots of other resources out there, as it is, is to deliver some sort of, you know, tablet from the mountain uh, of how to do this all right. But there's a bit of both in this presentation. 
Boilerplate is a necessary part of architecture and engineering. And so I'm going to present you the boilerplate that goes with this um, presentation because, of course, we also have errors and emissions insurance that we have to worry about. Silvio gave you an idea of the learning outcomes that I'm going to try and connect the presentation to and so that uh, to justify your Con Ed uh, credits uh, from the various organizations. Now, let's just get into this. The, the big starting point here to talk about is that uh, in the beginning, back in the good old days when people died at 40 with no teeth, um, we made buildings that were made of pretty much a single or a few materials. The walls were almost entirely solid and they had, were often based, especially if they were institutional and commercial buildings, were mineral based not uh, polymer based, that would include woods, or, or not metal based, that would include aluminum. Um, these were mineral based materials. And that is the tradition that our entire professional architectural and engineering background for enclosure walls comes from. Of course, these buildings, the left hand side being the oldest house in uh, North America, it's about 1200 uh, AD. Uh, or on the right, uh, a European, I think that's actually Edinburgh, um, of just solid masonry. This is not how we build anymore, with few exceptions. So there has been over, and it only has occurred, and I say only 100 years, because these types of shifts in the building industry are rather profound and shake its, its foundations. Uh, the, the, the past architecture that one would describe walking up to a building, which is the enclosure, was the same as the structure of the building. One could stand at the street and describe what held the floors and the roof up, what stopped the building from falling over, and at the same time describe what the wall enclosure was. Now, the solid masonry and or earthen mass, whether it be cob or adobe, that we once used evolved into, in the modern world, solid concrete, um, which we'll, we'll look at because we still built those in the post-war period. There's also a transition that started about 100 years ago where we, or a little over, over where we moved to masonry as infill, there was increasing reliance on an outside, an, an additional structural frame uh, in addition to the, the infill of the enclosure walls. And then we would apply in any kind of finish we wanted over top of it. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, this would sometimes literally get to the point of just gluing ceramic tiles to a masonry substrate. Now, these transitions resulted in building assemblies that actually started to become more hollow. They had more gaps. And there were reasons for these hollows and these gaps. Some of them were to improve moisture performance. Some of them were to improve thermal performance. And some of those gaps were there just to save materials because one less cartload of bricks saved everybody time and money. So we've moved from the solid masonry of the left-hand side of your screen up to the upper right-hand side, where now masonry uh, walls as an inside layer, as we'll find out the support structure for the enclosure, are becoming surprisingly rare, at least in North America, and increasingly rare in Europe. Now, this idea of separating the building superstructure from the building enclosure is fairly old, uh, but it really became more formally thought about in the early 1900s. So Corbusier's Domino House is actually one of its features that I don't think gets enough attention is that it explicitly argued for decoupling the enclosure from the superstructure so that the architect had much more flexibility about what kind of windows are put where, how many windows, so you had the freedom of separating those two things out. This approach was really taken up in high-rise buildings of the post-war era, but as much because of just practical construction realities, on, not on a, some sort of theoretical architectural freedom basis. The concept of high-rise buildings having a separate structural frame 
from enclosures was adopted fairly early. On the left-hand side of this slide, you see the Empire State Building under construction and the slightly earlier Chrysler Building. You can see the sign blaring occupancy, spring 1930. You look in many ways like a high-rise New York office tower would today because from this distance, you can't see the rivets used instead of bolts. Now, the enclosure was integrated in a different manner than it would be today in a high rise. There's actually profound differences in how the enclosure is treated today, whereas the structural systems are not as significantly changed in the intervening 90 years. On the left hand side here, you see some actual drawings from the, the original plans for the Empire State Building. And it just makes it clear how the structural frame made of steel was entirely embedded in a concrete and masonry enclosure floor sandwich. The whole thing acted together. Even at spots where, as you can see from the photograph on the right, there are significant aluminum panel sections. It's basically just an aluminum panel over an air gap over masonry. In other respects, it doesn't look like a modern wall at all. And by a modern wall at all, I mean it doesn't have an extra layer of insulation and it doesn't have anything identified as flashings or water barriers. So today, of course, we would be, for high rise, building a frame of concrete or steel and maybe increasingly of mass timber and then cladding it with an entirely separate support structure for the building enclosure and incorporating some performance requirements from air, sound, fire, et cetera, thermal, of course. And this approach allows and prefabrication, and it's quite common in high-rise buildings. It costs more money, but given the types of buildings that prefabricated enclosures work on, um, there are other challenges like space, uh, on the site and construction schedule that totally drive prefabrication. Now, meanwhile, between those two endpoints of say 1930 high rise and 2020 uh, high rise with curtain wall, we have this style of building, which in many ways was holding on to the idea of solid walls. You see the structure from the, st from the sidewalk. This is Trent University in Canada, um, and the mason, it's not masonry has been transformed into solid concrete because it's now the modern era. Now, these concrete walls were often uh, changed with style over time from just, say, the smooth white stuccoed concrete to the bare gray concrete to now adding things like sunshades um, and turning those into stylistic components. But at the end, when you looked at this wall, you saw a major solid chunk of concrete. And in many cases, such as the Trent University, the walls are actually supporting the floors, much like the walls of a building would have been in 1775. But in 1975, we would do this with concrete. The issue is, of course, that by switching to concrete, we move to a material that has much less thermal performance than, say, old style clay masonry. And increasingly, the expectations for performance increased. People at Trent University are not going to be satisfied with wearing waistcoats and tweed caps during their lectures. They expect the temperature in those rooms to reach 20 some degrees Celsius, 70 degrees Fahrenheit and no wall surface to be so cold as to get condensation. And that meant by the time Trent University was built or Boston City Hall was built, we knew that we had to add layers. And this is kind of the beginning of modern enclosures. It happened sooner in some types than others, but it's that we need to add layers moment, which is the start of the change. So the layer added here would be usually just some sort of insulation. Sometimes it was uh, fibrous insulation, sometimes it was foam insulation. And that meant that you now needed to 
add a separate layer on the inside because most people didn't think insulation was attractive. I Meaning a building scientist would love to look at insulation all day, but your average user of a building, not so much. So now we added two layers, the interior finish layer and the insulation layer. And over time we found by doing not very much by science, that if you didn't do a good job of making the insulation sealed and continuous, you could get condensation problems, the floor slabs remained cold and were big thermal bridges, and so on. Now, insulation started earlier than these solid concrete buildings. Even the move to double wide masonry, a brick layer on the inside and one on the outside, was written as having benefits to thermal performance. And they were, there were real benefits measurable to this day. Um, but if you want to stick to solid masonry, you needed to fill, make gaps in the masonry in a different way. So again, especially mainland Europe, uh, Germany being a center of this, they would make lots of uh, holy brick. Um, not like spiritually holy, but lots of voids in them. And they got increasingly sophisticated in the 70s after the oil shocks. And they also created tiny voids. So you see the macro voids with your eye, but if you look really close under a microscope, they made tiny bubbles in that as well, all trying to make the masonry have better thermal performance to meet both society's expectations and the increasing comfort demands of the occupants. We, what I don't have a photo here is of aerated concrete. And these products are a little under pressure from embodied energy uh, and embodied carbon. And both categories of product are responding to that. Now, in North America, we really didn't go very far down the lightweight uh, masonry or lightweight concrete approach. We dabbled, but it didn't happen nearly like it did in Europe. Uh, but we did start putting insulation on the inside of buildings rather early. And uh, the best that I can find goes back to the 1870s, where there are advertising to builders of mill buildings in New England about the benefits of putting insulation on the inside of your masonry to stop condensation from the high humidity that was necessary to spin fiber. The photograph on the right is actually a, 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 actually a kind of a mill building. It's a tobacco processing building in the American um, South Central Atlantic region. And this is about a 85 year old cork layer that was added to the insulation, to the interior of the masonry as insulation, um, which is over time degraded as it got wet. But we started being more uh, involved with putting insulation on the inside. And that lasted at least as a primary mode of building for 20 years or so, whether it was high-rise apartments, university buildings, or hospitals. Now, because of this in, in, uh, increase in insulation, building science researchers who now in the 1950s and 60s were a thing, um, began to look at this in the British Research Establishment, in Sweden, in Norway, in Canada. Places that have really crappy weather started doing building science research. And they started to write papers and make publications saying, there's a lot of problems with this insulation on the inside. It makes our cladding get much, much colder in the wintertime and much, much warmer in the summertime. This caused expansion and contraction of the masonry and premature aging. It also meant that the structure was cold enough that condensation could occur if water vapor were to reach it. And also, even in the 1960s, it was aware sufficiently to write it in papers that the floor slabs were meaningful thermal bridges that could not be resolved in this type of an approach. And so this idea of how to approach these new enclosures and really approach it in a different way, because now the mentality was we have multiple layers. We have a selection of materials we can use for structural systems and a, a desire to use different systems for aesthetic finishes, both inside and out. And this was the starting of what we'll call the perfect wall 
I'm putting quotes around that. Um, this this uh, particular drawing here was championed by the building this vision of building research, National Research Council of Canada. And from a 1964 paper showing temperature gradients in a six or eight page leaflet, which was distributed to architects and builders across the country, the argument was made that by putting the insulation on the outside of the built of the enclosure's support structure, you could also protect the superstructure and not protect it just from temperature, but also protect it from ultraviolet radiation, condensation, water vapor diffusion, condensation and air leakage both, and reduce thermal bridging and keep your primary structure warm and dry so it could last a long, long time. So that was the theory and the research that produced the concept. And then by the year, by the round the 2000s, ordinary buildings were prepared to hear about this concept. And so um, this is the perfect wall concept that was popularized by a uh, article from Joe Stebrick of Building Science Digest, um, and also by taken up by many uh, practitioners. And here I'm showing you uh, basically what I describe as a parquet diagram, because no one's saying this is a complete design. And it certainly isn't the only design that will work. And I'll show you some that others that work quite well. But it is sort of the baseline for how one looks at building enclosures increasingly in North America. This concept in is less commonly embraced in uh, Europe as far as I've ever been able to see. But we're starting to see some of the language being used in the, for example, the UK, air control, vapor control, water control are, la is, are labels being applied to products by some manufacturers and, and, and being used to say, if you want air control, I have a product that is an air control layer. In North America, we would probably call that an air barrier system, but what it does is control the flow of air. So these are the fundamental requirements for a successful enclosure, and they're really the minimum, because you may also need to add to this fire control. You might need to add acoustic control, but the basic components here are you need a su structural support for the enclosure it may not and often will not be the same as the superstructure of the building. Then you need to identify the four most important control layers in the order of importance, water, air, thermal, and lastly, vapor. And optionally shown in gray here are interior finishes. Often we need those finishes or want them. And often we need to provide fire protection. And so we will use fire protective materials that we then finish with paint or something. And also we have to think about how do I distribute electrical and plumbing and so on services through the building. And so that's an optional but often requirement of the building enclosure. So the reason this is the perfect wall, quote unquote, is that first of all, the layers, the functional layers are identified. Any analyst can look at this assembly and say, well, at least you've got an appropriate Part T diagram that you've got all of the fundamentally important control layers. And the second benefit is that this arrangement of your control layers will be essentially universally applicable. There are only a few exceptions where this won't work, but for almost all human occupied buildings, this is gonna work. And that doesn't mean it's the only way, but at least you know it's one way. You don't need to do a computer analysis if your assembly looks like this uh, to prove that it works or to find the dew point or other mystical things that people do uh, when it comes to building enclosure design these days. One can look at this by inspection and know that you have managed the condensation, or you don't have a dew point problem, etc. So this sort of mentality of listing what's required has become so baked into the Canadian psyche, not as much yet into American wine or certainly not in UK, that our national building code very clearly 
I uh, separates out part five of our code, which is environmental separation, which is the function of the building enclosure, from part four, which is structural design, which is the purpose of the superstructure. Two separate parts of our building code. Within the environmental separation part of the code, there's nice listings that very rationally break out what are the requirements. And as you can see here, heat transfer, air leakage, vapor diffusion are separate sections that you clearly address. Then there are several more because water's complicated and annoying. So they deal with precipitation, they deal with water at the surface and water below the surface. Also, I think a very logical way of thinking your way through the problem. It's often forgotten that the perfect wall aligns perfectly with the National Building Code of Canada. But uh, that's just in Canada. So, and also that doesn't necessarily mean it's physics is right. So one thing I would like to, to focus on, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time looking at air barriers and vapor barriers because of our limited time that we have available. Instead, I'm going to focus on the number one control to start with, which is water control, rainwater control. In an era where people are um, increasingly focused on energy performance, we're looking for air barriers. And certainly uh, there is an Air Barrier Association of America, um, but there isn't as much of a focus on the most important thing, which is rainwater penetration control. And I can tell you as a forensic engineer and somebody who works in a firm of about 300 building scientists that rainwater penetration remains overwhelmingly the biggest serious problem that faces new buildings today. And I know this to be the case even in places like Germany um, because they are, uh, you have to talk to practitioners who chase problem buildings to learn this. Nobody proudly makes press releases to say, yeah, my new building leaks. <laughs> um, so to find out what actually fails, you need to get an insurance agent drunk because they won't tell you if they're sober. Uh, or you need to hang out with forensic engineers who will often gladly tell you uh, just because they're excited about their work. Rain control has been a problem at least since the time of Vitruvius, where he wrote 2,000 years ago, it was the number one problem. Uh, until today. And yet, the people often get pulled away in their focus of the complexity to say, let's focus on vapor barriers. That was a, that was a several decades of lost uh, building performance. And now it's, let's focus on air barriers. And some are moving beyond, let's focus on thermal bridges. No, let's get rainwater control right. Then we'll worry about getting the air barrier right. And then we'll worry about getting our thermal control continuous, meaning right. But let me go back to what options do I have to deal with water, rainwater penetration? There are three, and this is a fundamental uh, feature of physics, which I'm not going to explain why, but there are three approaches. And the old approach, which aligns well with those solid masonry buildings we built for, oh, I don't know, 2,000 years plus, um, is what's called a mass approach. Rainwater is presumed to leak through the face of the masonry around mortar joints, and it's going to come through around window frames. Of course it is. It always has. But the masonry will absorb that water and can tolerate storing a lot and then dry it out when it's no longer raining. You get the balance of wetting and drying right, choose materials that are durable, and it works. But it does use a lot of material and particular kinds of materials. And as a consequence, uh, it's not what we always want. In the post-war period in particular, we jumped on the second approach, which is exclusion, meaning I'm gonna make a single layer somewhere in this building enclosure a waterproof layer. And that means that it required the advent of not just really good materials, because post-World War II, we had those. Um, we started getting really good membranes and polymers. But most importantly, it requires good techniques and materials at joints. 
because it wasn't the body of the membrane that caused leakage. It was always the joints, always the joints, always the joints. Nothing has changed in the last 75 years about this. It still remains always the joints. But perfect barriers are used a lot in the building industry, despite the fact that many people don't want to acknowledge it. Um, every sheet of glass in a building is a perfect barrier. Now, the joint between the glass and the frame should be not a perfect barrier. It should be designed as a drain system. But structural silicone is still routinely designed with good success as a perfect barrier. Low slope roofs are almost all designed as perfect barriers, single material that if it fails, you get a leak. Now, a third approach is something that comes out of uh, some of the vernacular architecture and designs of the 1800s and became a formal approach in the 1950s. A little bit earlier was it first mentioned as a concept, but it was being used literally 150, 200 years ago. It assumes that water will get past the outside surface, just like the old masonry walls did. However, it doesn't assume that enough materials are provided to store it. Instead, it distinguishes itself by draining of water that passes through back outward. And it also uses multiple layers to do that. The back of the cladding, the front of the insulation, for, for example, and it needs to therefore use flashings and weep holes to collect the water and direct it outward using the force of gravity. So today, drained approaches are seen as uh, quite reliable. They are, uh, but they're just as dependent on design as mass walls and perfect barrier walls. Just you have to worry about different things. But it's also important to recognize that drained approaches give us a lot of design flexibility. It allows us to choose a lot more leaky cladding systems. Uh, it allows us to add, do a lot more lightweight building structures, which are environmentally and economically sought after. Now, drained walls um, are sometimes called rain screens. So this is my first word I'm going to mention here in the Tower of Babel. Rain screen uh, takes on a number of meanings from a, depending who's speaking it uh, and where and when they're speaking it. Originally, the rain screen, as the word being used in the English language, was meant to describe a cladding that allowed water to penetrate through. Subsequently, it became known as a strategy which not only uh, drained walls, but also used pressure act, uh, equalization or something similar to help manage rainwater. In the meantime, now people use rain screen to describe claddings that are ventilated. Uh, we'll look at a few of these historical examples, but be, be clear, when you read the word rain screen, be very careful of context because in subtlety, they mean something different. As a rain control strategy, what's most important is that you have drainage. Uh, you must have drainage, flashings, weak poles, water resistive barriers, and rain screen might add something to that, but it depends who's speaking about it or writing about it. Now, you think historically, there's a lot of systems that we used that did not um, declare whether they were perfect barriers, whether they were face sealed or concealed barrier or storage mass systems or drain screens or rain screens. Uh, they just built walls. Uh, on the left hand side, we have sort of a very common uh, type in central Canada um, for institutional buildings in the late 50s into the 70s, which was concrete masonry melded together with clay brick masonry to make one monolith. Um, and this used a mass system, meaning it had enough mortar and enough uh, moisture tolerance to deal with the water that it saw, usually. The problem was, is that at this stage of development, we started to see how if you slim the wall down too much, if you expose it in taller buildings, like apartment buildings from the 60s were built this way, um, you would start to see 
the strategy running out of steam, meaning it wasn't able to put enough mass to resist the amount of rain. So it depends. This can work quite well in a dry climate, say Edmonton or Calgary, uh, and would fail miserably in a wetter climate, say, you know, Newcastle or Glasgow or something like that. Um, and so we saw the failures and the limits of this technology hit different regions at different times. Of course, interestingly, in Edmonton, they cared a lot more about thermal comfort earlier than they did, say, in Sacramento, where you didn't need as much insulation to get good thermal comfort. So those factors played into when these wall systems morphed into, quote unquote, modern systems. On the right hand side, we see something that I think a lot of North Americans would be surprised to know is that many masonry faced wood frame buildings were built with no water protection of the wood. This was not uncommon and particularly again in drier regions um, where the brick was not good enough, uh, the wood could tolerate wetting enough that we didn't do anything like we sure didn't do a rain screen there was no um, requirement for building paper but over time this is a this is a building from turn of the last century over time people started adding paper treated with tar to the outside of these wood structures and they found it provided that paper provided multiple benefits it helped resist liquid water penetration uh, and hence started to turn these systems into drained, perhaps even rain screen systems, depending on your definition. And it also helped improve the air tightness. The advertising for paper over top of board sheathing, like the building on the right, from the 1920s and as back far as the 1890s, it led with stop wind from blowing through the cracks in your walls. But it, both of those time eras absolutely mentioned water resistant and stop water that gets through your brick from wicking into your wood. Now, if we go to more of a theoretical scientific history, by 1967, Svensson, who from, uh, from Sweden, I know you're surprised with a name like that, um, started to write in a theoretical way about two-stage weather tightening. And to some people, this looks like a rain screen. Although the cladding is clearly identified as a rain barrier, the assumption at this stage was that the water would be stopped at the cladding and the air pressure would be stopped. Well, we're not sure. We think by wind barrier, they mean air barrier. And this remains a problem in today's looking at uh, Scandinavian literature to 2021. They still don't really use the term air barrier. Um, but they do have a water vapor diffusion barrier. Uh, they don't say diffusion, so we're not sure if they mean airflow or diffusion. But this was a concept uh, that was the start of thinking about rain screens. The term rain screen was used um, in the 60s by some authors, including Canadian ones, um, and it became taken up by the American Association uh, for curtain wall designers, uh, AMA, and in 1971, in their curtain wall design manual, they produced a section on rain screen design. Um, these uh, approaches, none of them included a water resistive barrier or WRB. A WRB is now in, in, in America is a very common label on a material. Its job is to be a water resistive barrier. Not weather, that's not, tr that's not correct, it's inaccurate. It's, it's a water-resistive barrier. In Canada, this term actually doesn't exist in our codes and standards. We use something called, the term in our codes and standards is a sheathing membrane. But many practitioners are adopting the water-resistive barrier as a label for a product that is resistant to water, go figure. Um, but this is a relatively recent invention, some may be surprised to learn. It was only in the 90s that practitioners and researchers alike began to write about the need for a water resistant layer on the interior side of a cavity that drained water. 
So that became, um, uh, became the basis for modern North American design. This is a British textbook. It's not even a textbook. It's a book produced by a professional association that was intended to advise practitioners in the UK and beyond. Um, and it has a nice title, Rain Screen Cladding. And within this book, it's hard to find, uh, but I have one. Um, it actually defines two different types of rain screen cladding. I'm putting quotes around it. Because on the left-hand side, they have what they call a drained and back ventilated system. And on the right-hand side, they have what's called a pressure equalized rain screen. To a building scientist today, looking at them, both drawings have glaring omissions. So whether you call it back drained and ventilated or not, you should have an air barrier. And this system, the labeling is explicit. It doesn't include an air barrier. It includes a water barrier. On the right-hand side, it explicitly includes an air barrier, but it doesn't have a water barrier. Um, for some reason, by this time, people thought you could pick whether you have an air barrier and whether you have a water barrier. Um, but I would say that it's pretty firm in the orthodoxy in the last 20 years in North America that you need both an air barrier and a water barrier. And so this distinction is a bit odd. Um, we could talk about pressure equalized systems versus non-pressure equalized systems, but that's a bit of a subtlety. Both of those would always have a water barrier and an air barrier. And by water resistive barrier, sheathing membrane, building paper, sarking, underlay, all these words are used, we mean a, a layer that provides resistance to water penetration, not usually a waterproofing, it's usually water resistant, and it is lapped in a gravity flashing that leads to flashings, which then um, direct water out through weep holes. That's the drained approach that some like to think of. Now, this approach was not uh, by any stretch universally applied in 1990 or even 2000. Um, but in 1990, this is um, about the time they built this University of Connecticut Law Library. And while some of you may think this looks like an old masonry building, it's in North America, so of course it isn't. It is made to fake one. So the style of the campus is to replicate some of the famous campuses of the UK. Um, and so, but they didn't, there's no need to use a whole bunch of masonry. So of course, what they built was thinner stone on the exterior, four inch, um, CMU, concrete masonry unit, as the structural support for that cladding, all held together on a concrete frame. Um, now, when they built that system, they built it kind of like, well, they didn't really think about water, rainwater control. They had brick, block, they had steel studs with gypsum on the inside, no water control, which is why they were able to pay for very large crane rentals to do water spray tests. Water spray tests are something that are fundamental to a forensic building scientist. And shockingly, we always ask, but why do you want a water spray test? We already know it's leaking. That's why you called me. Um, but really, we then have to drill down into, so what are you going to learn from the water test? And a lot of times, we're just demonstrating what we already know by looking at the drawings. In this project, it was obvious from the drawings that it was going to leak at floor slabs and any penetrations since there was no water-resistive barrier. Now, it wouldn't always leak because sometimes you get lucky, uh, but it was going to leak sometimes. Um, and certain details would leak more often than others. So hence the, the nice big rig with the spray rack. And then if you, here's the interior of the library uh, where water is leaking through. And by the time we're there, this has been leaking since the, 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 they built the building. And it is now uh, about eight years, nine years later. Um, and, you know, you can't fix this. Well, you can, no, but you can't fix it easily. Um, the only reliable way of fixing this is to remove the stone and put, put on a WRB and put the stone back again, 
which for reasons I think are obvious is not normally the desired approach to the repair. So this concept of a WRB, a water resistive barrier made of felt paper, polymer wraps, asphalt membranes, et cetera, even sheet metal and glass can be water resistive barriers leading to flashing, then flashing leading to the outdoors is fundamental to providing the number one requirement of a building enclosure, and that is resisting rainwater penetration. So we've often now been combining water control with air. And if you think back to the RT diagram of the perfect wall, that makes sense. Like locate the water and the air barrier in the same plane in your wall, and you may as well make them the same. You can't just gravity lap an air barrier because when air blows on it, it'll open up. Um, and so it'll leak. So you need to do uh, a lap for, for rainwater control and then seal it for air barrier control. We also can combine, if you do the real perfect wall, the vapor barrier with the air and the water barrier. And so you buy one product that does three functions. And then you're, you've got those three functions out of the way with a single line on a drawing set. Now you have to put it in the right place, e.g. outboard of the, superstru of the structure and the superstructure and inboard of the thermal insulation and cladding and then you have the perfect wall and we don't have to do analysis. This is a building that was built in 2002 locally at the University of Waterloo. Uh, I took the picture on the left uh, when it was being, this was my first years working here and I was so ecstatic that these people actually knew what they were doing. They provided a asphaltic coating over top of the concrete masonry unit structure, superstructure I mean, um, and they put asphaltic membrane over top of that. They covered that with insulation. You can see the blue membrane that's being used to flexibly transition from the black asphalt membrane to the window frame. And on the right-hand side, you see some of the benefits of going to a perfect wall, which is you can mix and match cladding randomly as the feeling strikes you, uh, which they of course did here and certainly even to this day, you kind of need to mix and match randomly with cladding to win architectural awards. And so by, follow, by putting the air, water, and vapor control layer outboard the superstructure and support structure, add insulation, you can now just switch up what kind of cladding you want. Terracotta, metal panels, fiber cement, brick veneer, aluminum panels, whatever. Doesn't matter. Uh, because from a point of view of enclosure functionality, all of those options are valid. You now only have to specify that cladding based on its impact and fire resistance, its UV degradation capabilities, its freeze thaw tolerance, and the rest. But all the functionality of the building enclosure is embedded in behind. Now let's take a look at some photographs from Europe. Um, I didn't want to, you know, I, I didn't pick any pictures here from the UK, uh, particularly. On the left-hand side, we see Belgium. Uh, reinforced concrete uh, building with a brick veneer cladding. You see the insulation and what you also don't see is a water resistive barrier. This is something that really took, took me aback in the early 2000s that they were just not doing WRBs. Um, also not much of a cavity there. That doesn't matter from a drainage perspective, but it can matter from a drying of the cladding perspective uh, because ventilation can actually dry the back of the brick a little bit, and that can be helpful. On the right-hand side, we see a, a German multi-family three-story building being constructed. There are insulated bricks there on the left, but of course that's not enough to meet modern building codes uh, without getting very thick, so they add some insulation, but no water-resistive barrier. And that's because there's a belief that none is needed and that gap will stop water from getting across. Another project, this is one in, in, in Holland actually, um, of you can see the brick, uh, clay fired brick as the interior, the extruded polystyrene insulation outboard and a brick veneer and no sign of an air or water barrier. Now the air barrier was often and still is often uh, used is the wet applied plaster on the interior. 
um, it's, it works pretty well because it is continuous without joints. But if you want to get to really high tightness levels, it's actually quite a challenge to make sure you get all of the transitions correct. Now you have to get all the transitions correct for the water resistive barrier as well. And so the same effort is put in, if you put the water resistive barrier on the exterior of the support structure, then you can put the, deal with all the transitions, et cetera, at the same time. You get the air barrier and the water barrier detailing. To this day, it is uncommon to see literature for cladding systems and insulation systems in the UK and on the continent um, to show a, wa a separate water resistive barrier. There is a belief that masonry doesn't have cracks, concrete doesn't have cold joints, there are no form ties, and water doesn't get through. And while especially cast in place concrete is pretty good, it still leaks. Uh, and I guess you, I could just show you pictures. What's even more interesting is that as we think more about using wood frame buildings uh, for carbon and environmental, other environmental reasons, we see uh, images like this. This is a three-year-old, four-year-old manual of um, timber design from Sweden. And there's no mention of a water resistive barrier. It's not clear if the air barrier is being, is called the wind barrier here, the wind protection barrier. And this comes to the language issues. And our experience, uh, my personal experience, my firm's experience, RDHs, and many other building science firms I deal with, essentially all of them would say, leaks occur at holes. I know you're surprised. Uh, but leaks occur at cracks, openings, and penetrations of all types. It's not the body of the wall that's leaking as much as it is the transition at cold joints, at window penetrations, door penetrations, balcony penetrations, ductwork, et cetera. And as a consequence, Codes in common practice in North America has been that you must provide a water control layer. Often we label that a WRB, um, and sometimes we combine it with an air barrier. So it, modern walls that look something like this uh, almost always will have a layer of air tightness and water tightness explicitly identified or they explicitly exist. And the problem in modern architectural practice is that at least half of the drawings that I see do not explicitly call out the water control layer. They might call out the water barrier, uh, the air barrier, I mean, and then they will say, yeah, well, what I meant is it's also the water barrier. Well, the reason we use words is to say what we mean, not to imply what we might mean. And so I think it's a, a, a real fundamental thing in improving practice is to say, do you want it to be a water barrier, an air barrier, and a vapor barrier? Actually list what those um, functions, how are they provided in your wall assembly? As I mentioned, not all these assemblies uh, have uh, exist in all types of buildings. Um, so we routinely build perfect barrier, face, uh, face seal, I guess you'd call them, type systems, um, and they work. Now, glass is the obvious one, panes of glass, um, but precast concrete is another very common system where instead of just using 1.2 meter by 1.8 meter high chunks of glass, you know, four by six foot chunks of glass, we might use a 20 foot wide by 12 foot tall chunk of concrete. And it's built in a factory. It has no brick, no ties or no penetrations in it. And so it's perfectly fine to make that watertight. We now need to design the joints to be drained systems because they're made in the field of polymers that degrade. But the panel itself, despite what some of you will know, the Ontario Architect Association thinks, it doesn't leak rainwater. We also have insulated metal panel systems, which are two skins of metal glued to foam. Uh, Kingspan would be the obvious producer uh, in the UK. Well, these systems are not drained or rain screened. And where do they have a risk of leaking? At the joints. And do they have a lot of joints? Oh yeah, they got a lot of joints. So it's all about joint design when it comes to insulated metal panels and uh, precast concrete. But precast concrete is an example of an old sort of technology that 
is um, can be new again in that it can be prefabricated. It can be uh, not as heavyweight as it used to be if you don't want it to be. Um, and you can actually get very interesting shapes and forms out of it. But you need to recognize that it's not a rain screen. And therefore, the work that you have to do to detail these things is at the joints. Maybe I would say particularly the joints around the window. That's where the most action is. So as I showed you some examples of what the precast layers might look like. Here's a little bit more of a detail. And also I'm showing you a photograph of what you may think is a brick building, but of course it isn't. If you look at the bottom, you'll see there's a truck there with precast concrete panels that are faced with brick. Again, the materiality throws people off and that's fine as long as you're not the designer of record. This is a face sealed system that must have drain joints. And that is what needs to be designed. And that's the challenge and the potential for confusion of really interesting projects like this, which solve all kinds of problems really well. But you got to keep in mind the basics of how air and water work. Now, I I'm going to talk a little bit about the Tower of Babel here. I've already indicated, hopefully, a couple of good examples for you to think about. But I just the changes as we've gone from this solid masonry wall here on the left, where maybe it had plaster on the inside, maybe it didn't, to the multi-layer assembly on the right, where we have a cladding that is distinct from insulation, which is distinct from interior finish, which is distinct from fire control, water control, and air control. And I intentionally drew this uh, image here that it doesn't tell you what anything does. It labels what it is, not what it does. And this becomes a big source of confusion and problems because people will then substitute materials that they think are the same, except they don't perform the same function. So if you label gypsum wallboard as a finish, but you're actually using it for fire control, somebody can't just substitute out the gypsum wallboard with fine veneered plywood. It's great as a finish substitution. It's disastrous as a fire control substitution. And the lack of design clarity in intent on the labeling of drawings results in a significant number of problems. More important than workmanship, let's put it that way, in terms of the, the likely cause of a problem. So as I hinted at before, WRB is a water resistive barrier, not weather resistive. Go check your code, You'll, you won't find it. You'll only find water resistive. Um, and I don't know whether they're calling it a water control layer in the UK, but it's certainly hard to find in many drawing systems and codes in the UK. The air barrier is something that's very popular in terms of achieving higher performance buildings, and it should be, but you can't forget that the water barrier is the thing that's gonna stop you from getting sued. Um, and then vapor barrier is something that people often obsess over, but often, most cases, doesn't have that big of a role to play. So we get this confusion in I don't even know what a moisture barrier is because I don't know whether you mean moisture in vapor form or in raindrop form, or are you talking about water that's wicking through materials that you're blocking? We have things like WRB, which are code defined in some jurisdictions, and things like sarking, which exist in, say, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK, Scotland, Ireland. Um, so, but what does it actually what it perform? What does it actually perform? It's just a label. What does it do? What do you, as a designer, intended to do? Underlays are sometimes used in wall construction as a term for what I would call a WRB, maybe an air barrier. We have things like house wrap. Um, what does it do? Is it an air barrier or a water barrier or both? What is your intent as a designer? Please label it. Um, underlay on a roof. It's really just a drainage layer. A WRB for a roof in North America. Um, so equal confusion exists for waterproofing versus damp proofing versus a DPC versus a capillary break. Um, and the lack of clarity means we often get the wrong materials specified. 
And constructors often make the wrong choice when they're doing substitutions or how they're doing inspections. An example of where the perfect wall may not always work is when we actually call it a wall, even though it may have slaped, sloped walls like this. So walls that are sloped, I would call roofs and I would design them accordingly. Unfortunately, not everyone believes the same thing. Uh, and so on that particular building, what you see here is that this is actually the assembly of that building being uh, constructed. Um, now, this actually has a very good water resistive barrier, water control, air control. It's the perfect wall, except that the details were such that they sloped it back and then they used Zs or Zs, depending which side of the border you're on, um, to hold the insulation, which not only had thermal implications, but it also act like big gutters to stop water from draining away. So they literally blocked water, focused it on areas that then could easily fail because the amount of water was like a fire hose when it rained. So when we're dealing with things like sloped uh, walls, um, we're gonna usually modify the WRB. We're either going to change that water control layer to something that is a full-on roofing membrane with all of the details that go with it, or we're gonna use a sort of a multi-layer approach. This is an example of how they've done this with a fiber cement open jointed cladding on a pretty clear slope. So maybe that helped the designer know that this was basically a roof, not a wall. And um, this is sort of the, the layering that was applied there. The cladding, of course, no longer sheds water. It's, it's not really a rain screen anymore because 100% of the water that falls on this surface will penetrate and therefore at the joints. Therefore, your real water shedding surface and rain screen is the next layer down below, which has to be UV resistant if you have open joints, and it's likely gonna fail somewhere sometime. And that's why there's the perfect wall air water barrier on the deck, which um, is of reasonable quality because most of the water is protected. So these are the subtleties of, that one has to get into when you're doing abnormal systems, like things that we don't have a lot of experience with. But this certainly uh, has worked uh, and we would deploy this as consultants on pretty much any leaky cladding that's put on a slope that's other than perfectly vertical. As soon as you put it on an angle of a few degrees, you have to start thinking of it more like a roof. And it's not enough to just put it on an, uh, to put multiple layers. Here's an example where the Glasgow Science Center, which I had no involvement with at all, I learned this only vicariously through the media. These are titanium panels, so very cool. Actually, not very cool, very hot. Titanium, like zinc, is well known to have low emissivity in the infrared spectrum, and so when it gets sun shining on it, it heats up more than even a dark colored metal roof. Um, and there's a number of interesting building materials that are being used like that today. Now, they, you know, in many ways, they did it right. They said, we're going to use a high performance water resistive barrier. And they installed it with lots of careful detailing and they made a heavy asphaltic basis, but they didn't use the perfect wall. This membrane is on the outside of the insulation and therefore it gets just as hot as the cladding. And what that means is it gets very hot. Even though Glasgow isn't known for its scorching summers, it still has sun, maybe not as often as Glaswegians would like, but it has sun. And as a consequence, there were enough days that heated up the titanium enough to melt the asphalt and have it come dripping out. Had there been exterior insulation outside of that WRB waterproofing type membrane, no issues. They wouldn't even needed much insulation. Alternatively, they would have had to choose some pretty special um, high temperature products that can withstand the temperatures that are well over the boiling temperature of water. Like we measure these things at 110 degrees and occasionally you can get into the 120s uh, under specific construction characteristics. 
And that, to have a sloped bituminous membrane that doesn't flow under those temperatures and is durable for, under those temperatures is hard. It's easy to put insulation on the outside and problem solve. So just a few more um, slides to give you a hint about what might this apply to the future. First thing is we're gonna see more and more change. Uh, people are gonna change claddings systems and enclosure systems, whether you like it or not. Um, we're gonna see on the artistic side, more artistic enclosures like Silvio began at the beginning of, if you got enough money, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, we're gonna see more insulation and most likely it's gonna be on the exterior of the superstructure and support structure because that's where it works by dealing with thermal bridges. Um, we're going to see us forced to use different materials or different formulations of tried and true materials that have lower carbon content. Um, and we're going to try and de, you know, de-weight, de-mass, lightweight our enclosure assemblies. That's been going on for a long time, uh, especially in Asia and in North America in the high-rise market. But we're seeing that removing the amount of materials that we use from both economic and ecological regions. These exotic enclosures create exotic problems. And although Silvio talks about building science consultants as forensic people, we are, but hopefully we can also take that forensic experience and apply it to never done before articulations of facades of materiality. And some of the things that we do for very good reasons, like on the left-hand side, shading and light shelves to improve daylight quality and reduce thermal uh, gains in the summer uh, also result in serious problems if you were to get snow. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to get a lot of snow. It's like the Glasgow roof situation. All you need is enough of those weather events to cause a life safety risk. And uh, I think most of us have noticed this across cities that have snowfall. Um, and ice is actually more dangerous than snow for, I think, obvious reasons. Uh, and so you end up putting signs up, you put up barricades, and there's an ongoing maintenance problem. An example of, of um, other issues that come up with these exterior shades is the New York Times building, where they use basically ceramic type rods um, to make good diffuse light. Why do they need to do that? Well, because they chose too many windows. That's a separate issue. So if you have all floor to ceiling glass, you got too much glass, now you have to spend more money to deal with it. Their solution was to use ceramic rods, which pro provided excellent climbing surfaces. They dealt with the snow and, fall snow and ice falling by a podium design to capture and break up and absorb the, the weight. But they didn't think about the fact that people could climb up and they have many times and they're They've done some changes to the building to try and minimize the ease at which people can get up at it. Um, so almost all of these so-called advanced and new enclosures are actually quite complex, expensive, and resource intensive. So in fact, they, they are in opposition to the trends that I described earlier, or people are looking for lower weight, lower carbon, and most of them are also not really low energy. They're lower energy to provide shades in a double facade than not providing shades. But maybe the, for sure, <laughs> the lower energy solution is don't use a double facade. That's just energy intensive. So I think that we're going to get more focus on that. And we're going to cut fewer artists slack who want to do that. Um, and we're moving to embodied carbon, even in RDH common practice, as being a more important metric than energy, uh, because the reason we mostly care about energy is about the carbon. And the climate crisis is such that we're really focusing on the carbon that we're both going to admit and build in. Um, so we've been involved in a bunch of projects as a firm and also the university and research projects on mass timber. And so high rise buildings in the bottom left, like Brock Commons, uh, also living building challenge buildings, such as the bullet center in Seattle on the lower right, um, that involve different materials, not just different design techniques. And this has driven um, more and more to consider 
support layers that are not made of concrete or steel, but are made of mass timber, as you might see here. And these changes result sometimes in people just not following the rules. So this is from a CLT handbook in Sweden again, a manufacturer of CLT who is proposing that we put all the insulation on the inside of the CLT. Um, this doesn't work very well. And we've already seen failures like this where people have tried to use the CLT as either a moisture exposed component or as an air barrier. Um, it, it isn't either of those things. The perfect wall arrangement for CLT is ideal. Uh, it really means that you can honestly look your client in the face and say that CLT will last for the next century, which is what many would like to hear who are going to invest in the price that CLT costs to achieve it. We've even you know, tried to you know, work on wood curtain wall assemblies on some of our projects. Uh, numerous architecture firms are really pushing on that. Um, and uh, it's actually something we can quite readily do, uh, but you do have to understand that there are different materials. And again, we're using the perfect wall approach at the floor slab. You'll notice we switch from the curtain wall to a membrane that is the air water vapor control layer with insulation on the outboard of that. And suddenly all of this works. So, I mean, in summary, I'd say the basics, if you uh, buy into them, uh, really allow us to manage change of materials and approaches and construction, the complexities of building design by matching functions of the building enclosure with particular solution. If you're looking for a water resistive barrier, don't choose CLT. Uh, if you're looking for continuous insulation, make sure that your cladding is outside of your superstructure, things like that. And really it's from those basics that you spin off into, I guess what we would call the solution universe uh, that's out there. So, um, now we have a chance to um, have some conversation, answer some of the questions that might be in the Q&A chat function. And so uh, to do that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll switch over and maybe uh, either Chad or Silvio or Elena will let us know what we're doing next. Thanks, John. I think we've got uh, Chad on the line and uh, while he's uh, getting ready for that, I just wanted to uh, uh, thank you, but I'll thank you later too. Um, that, that was excellent. Um, one of the things that I, I just wanted to touch on uh, and, and maybe you can give us some advice. I mean, my, my chief draftsman's gone. I, I have no one in my office to go to. And, and when you talk about the perfect, uh, perfect wall, I, uh, and you touched on this as, as, as you went through and, and even if you follow the basics, I, I think that the, you know, when people are, are, are looking at um, building enclosures, it's everything that goes along with the building enclosures. It's the window openings, it's the door openings, it's the vents, it's all of those details that used to be so simple. I mean, you know, when I started, it, it, it was simple. It was in architectural graphic standards. SMACNA had a great book out that I still got one in our office that, that, that showed you how to actually do uh, flashings. I mean, and, and, and those were the things that were so important. And, uh, you know, I, I still loan it out to people. I'm not sure who's got it right now in my office, but it, it, it's all of those details that uh, are hard to find. And there's so much stuff on the internet and, and we are so inundated with people grabbing stuff on the internet, whether it's, it's from the manufacturers or whether it's from some project that's in Europe. Um, I, maybe you want to comment on that because you absolutely so much of this. Um, and, and there's two, there's two, I'd say there's two things about your, your, your comment question. Um, one is that like we need to, the details are really where it's at. Okay. And, and I, I mean, totally you're correct, but Silvio, the problem is, is that to do the details, you need to know what the basic assumptions are. And so when we see a precast concrete building and you install a window in that, 
The, the reason that the details come out often completely wrong is that they're applying the, the same detail that they apply to a brick cavity wall. And, and so then the first hard part of the job is to explain that, oh, this isn't a brick cavity wall, this is a face sealed system, and our insulation is inside of the support structure, so that totally changes how we're going to approach the window. And so I, I was trying to focus on the, like, make sure you recognize how different those two systems are. Similarly, let's say insulated metal panels. Um, so that's part one of your, your, your common question. But the other one was about, then we go to the internet and I actually, it's not even just about climate being different. Uh, it's really that people, uh, some, many of the details are wrong like literally flat out incorrect. They don't have an air barrier that's visible in the, forget the label. You can look at the drawing and see there are holes that let air blow through it. And so, but mind you, if I take a detail from an Edmonton firm, there are no holes in the air barrier by and large. They, they, they figured out through pain and suffering that they need to have a good air barrier, but they'll often uh, tolerate rather significant thermal bridges that an Irish passive house architect would just die if they saw them. So back to like those details, it's gotten more complicated than, than geography. It's also what are you focusing on and what are you interesting? Um, and it, what you're interested in achieving. That's I guess what I'm saying. And so that's why going back at the beginning and say, okay, so what is your water resistant barrier, air barrier? What's your thermal control? And then you can start asking, so how important is it that you, how, what kind of thermal performance you're targeting? And this is, a, I would say, it should be schematic design phase. This should be written down. It shouldn't be talked about. It should be written down to so that you avoid wasted circular arguments as you go through design development and then the contractor comes through and value engineers meaning removes all value from the project because nobody can identify no no the reason we did that was for this performance objective and so i think the clarity of saying i know what i want and here are my design solutions to that can actually solve a lot of annoying problems <laughs> throughout your, uh, the whole design process. And I forget when we even get to the job site. Okay, uh, Chad. Sorry, the, the questions are starting to come in. They're starting to roll in now, so this is great. Uh, so I get one question from uh, Peter from our Chicago office. Uh, curious to know what John thinks of the exterior insula insulation finish system wall and which is widely used in the US. And but fell out of favor temporarily, and now is is coming back because of the cost. Huh. Well, you know, first of all, I'm interested to hear you say it's coming back. Um, so EIFS, synthetic stucco, etics is often a terminology used in in Europe. Um, actually, it follows depends. It follows the perfect wall as it is mostly done in commercial buildings in North America, meaning. Behind the insulation, we have a full air, uh, air water barrier with a, a small drainage gap. So you have synthetic stucco, some sort of a glass mesh reinforced. You have EPS or rock wall insulation. You have a small gap, often a fraction of an inch, eighth of an inch or smaller, a couple of millimeters. Then you have your air water barrier and then you have your substrate. That's a great system. I mean, you got to be care be aware of its limitations. Mostly, there's impact resistance limitations, um, and if you're using EPS, there are fire as as the insulation. There are fire limitations, but frankly, it got a completely horrible reputation because people tried to build it over wood frame or steel frame substrates with no WRB. They did not. That it, it, I can summarize the multi-billion dollar fiasco that was EFS in the 90s and early 2000s as they didn't have a WRB or drainage. And EFS today, all the manufacturers in North America have drained solutions and they work really well from a point of view of water control. And thermally, they're almost the best that we know how to offer. We, we have to spend a bit more money to get impact resistance on them. Uh, and but I actually think quite highly of those as a, as a design solution. There, there's technologically, there, you shouldn't be scared of them. Just understand what they're good at because they're good at a lot of things. 
another question from Arnav Gard. Uh, can you provide examples of a good water resistant barrier? Oh, a good one. Well, you know, good depends on your budget and your climate and your wall design. But I mean, very commonly in North America, we use uh, self adhesive bituminous membranes, um, brand names being like, uh, you know, um, Baycor Blue Screen, Suprema, Sopra Seal, uh, Grace, uh, Air and Water Shield type products. Those are great, but they're not just a good WRB. They're also good air, air barriers. And whether you like it or not, they're vapor barrier. And so that means all the insulation usually has to be on the outside. So other WRBs are more water and air barriers that are also vapor permeable might be things like Tyvek. Um, and so Tyvek is a really good water resistive barrier. It just doesn't stick on the wall. So it's easier to screw up. So there's a constellation of WRBs out there. Um, and really it is a matter of matching, you know, what kind of longevity and performance are you expecting? Is this a 20 story building, a 40 story building or a one and a half story building immersed in the trees of Seattle or something like that? Uh, a question from David Cluzio. Uh, the observation of about the lack of barriers in Europe is quite a surprise. Is it because the climate is more modest or is it because it's less critical? Um, I, I don't think it is because the climate is more modest. Uh, I mean, if, if you work in uh, Trondheim, Norway, and, and I would say like in the Outer Hebrides in Scotland, um, there's nothing mild about those climates. Um, but a lot of the tradition of institutional commercial architecture was based on masonry. Um, the leaks were managed by masonry and the leaks could be tolerated, you know, uh, and that meant that there wasn't as much of a focus, but as that type of construction morphs to more lightweight, hollow and concrete, actually complex assemblies, that forgiving nature of solid masonry walls is going away. And that's the bigger reason why there aren't as many of these ideas of, of barriers. And, and I, I, I'm glad, David, that I surprised you with the barriers because uh, it's amazing how many North Americans have no idea of the fact that you can build a concrete wall with brick veneer and not put a WRB on it. Like they, they're just, their heads just explode if you mention that. And yet it's not uncommon uh, to do that in France and Germany. It, it's, it is very common. Next question is from Bruce McKenzie from our Calgary office. Uh, John, thank you for the presentation. I particularly appreciated your recognition of regional differences in construction techniques, history, and how that impacts, impacts building envelopes. Uh, per Silvio's comment, where, what is your go-to manual for building envelopes? <laughs> well, it's your secret. Okay. Um, so I would say that, for example, architectural graphic standards is actually really uh, fallen behind uh, in, in terms of, it, it, of what the, the more leading edge stuff is. Um, so I have the SMACMA manual, but I don't rely on it for window flashing anymore because we don't use a lot of sheet metal because of thermal issues and we have improved, say, fluid applied flashes. So there's, been some, there's still ongoing rapid change, which is a challenge, I think, for a firm like NOR is like, geez, you know, you might have got on top of things. And then four years later, lots of stuff changes. Ah, so what do I use? I don't actually look, we, frankly, we write manuals, you know, RDH has half a dozen of them. Uh, I write books on this because I find that it's hard to find manuals and books that fit into like what you say is that could work in Calgary and in Sacramento. I mean, there's, it's actually quite a challenge to, and you have to, you know, kind of cover that off. And then Calgary versus Halifax. And I'm just uh, not even jumping over the pond. Um, so it's hard to find. And so I, I guess I just don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> uh, next question is from John Kulos from our Philadelphia office. Uh, with the proliferation of new cladding systems, are you seeing many problems associated with uh, the structural thermal, thermal movements? So uh, first point is that there is a proliferation in new cladding projects. Um, I, I would say that I haven't seen a proliferation of structural and thermal movements. I want to give you a caveat there. 
almost all of these cladding project products, architects and builders know, look, these things, we're going to decouple them from the support structure and they're going to have joints around windows and all that. And so although the movement occurs, it doesn't usually result in pinching, buckling, bowing, sheared connectors, unless you really don't have half inch gaps or whatever. But what we are seeing is some of them don't uh, fare very well in with some combination of moisture, uh, sun, and or freeze thaw. So those are the three sorts of, of failure mechanisms of new and untried products that we see. Um, and then, you know, you can do a bunch of tests. That's why we have a building science labs. Uh, but really the ultimate test is to go and look at buildings in a similar climate and see whether those panels are turning into potato chips when you in fact wanted them to be flat uh, or lose their color. I'm looking through the window of our school of architecture and we, we actually uh, clad part of it with a fiber cement product that had a charcoal black kind of color. It's now a very nice close, not white, it's sort of a dirty gray white. Uh, so the color completely got lost over the years. And you just, you're gonna have to yeah, make sure you will accommodate movement in every cladding system today uh, because the substructures move more. That's another thing to realize. But then also you need to look for real life experience followed up if you can with some testing to accelerate a bit of that. But nothing beats me walking out to a building that's seven or eight years old that's similar in exposure to what I'm working on. And unfortunately, that takes time for these manufacturers. They have to start small and work up. Uh, next question is from David Spry. Uh, hi, John. Can you speak to uh, hydrothermal performance aspects of thick, high insulation R100 manufactured panels regarding potential for internal moisture and hygiene issues? Yeah. So uh, hydrothermal issues are, you know, just just what I get up in the morning for. Most of you, you know, normally like roll your eyes and bleed from your ears, but R100 is interesting in that it actually doesn't matter much whether you have R, a real R20 or a real R100. So the real changes occur when you start, when you go from like an R5 or R6 and, and, and get to R20, that's where mu much of the action of change is. By the time you're at R20, that exterior face of your cladding enclosure system is so close to the outdoor temperature that whether you take R20, 30, or 40 doesn't matter. Um, but the, it, when you have a manufactured panel, um, which you, I don't know exactly what you mean, but the issues are like those uh, two sheets of metal glued to a core, the challenge becomes bowing. Uh, when you attach the exterior of that uh, cladding to the insulation, and it goes through different temperatures across thicker and thicker distances, you end up with more and more risk of bowing. Sometimes that bowing is merely an aesthetic issue. Many times it actually tears seals, fasteners, and joints apart. Um, but, you know, whether it's pre-manufactured or if it's separated, it doesn't matter if it's manufactured or not. I can make you an R100 wall. I just can't see why you'd bother doing that. Like, you're just wasting resources in almost every case. I think we, we, we did a project for the new McMurdo Sound Station in Antarctica. And, you know, doing some analysis about how many R value we need. And we, we couldn't justify R100 in, in Antarctica where they fly in a lot of the fuel. <laughs> so, I mean, and then run a diesel generator. So it's just like it's the most expensive fuel around almost. And um, it's really cold place, Antarctica. And you can't justify R100. So maybe you need to ask a bit more about should we be thinking about R40 rather than R100? Uh, another question from David Clusio. Uh, are you doing consulting uh, since our offices are in North America, so U.S. and Canada, in the in Europe? You know, are you doing any consulting in Europe or just in Canada? Well, uh, um, so I would say right now I would probably do almost fifty percent in the United States, um, and, and almost fifty percent in Canada, and then the leftover is in places like Europe, uh, uh, Middle East. Australasia. I've done a bunch of projects in New Zealand with rain penetration, but we've all, I've also done lots, lots. I've done some projects in the Gulf area uh, with uh, condensation. Done some projects in Morocco, believe it or not, with rain penetration. 
and certainly done work in the UK and Scandinavia, but you know, a lot of times for building owners and or product manufacturers, um, not on the new design side, more solving problems, developing new products. Uh, next question is from Elizabeth Spellman. Uh, you know, very enjoyable presentation. I worked in the late 90s, early 2000s on the Boston Society of Architects Building Envelope Committee uh, with Waggy Ennis. I learned so much from this group and I was wondering if there's any, is there a similar group in the GTA or virtual or anything? So that's great, Elizabeth. Um, the Building Envelope Committee has, be, has morphed into building enclosure councils and they exist now since that starting time, which I know well and worked with Wagdi literally back in the day um, when we were doing air barriers and such. Um, building enclosure councils exist throughout North America and now also in, uh, there's actually one in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, but they, um, in, in Ontario, it's called the Ontario Building Envelope Council. So those were sort of the beginnings. They started uh, in the 80s. And there is one in Alberta. The Alberta. There's actually one for Southern Alberta and Northern Alberta, two separate building enclosure councils. Um, there's the Ontario Building Enclosure Council. There's the Ottawa Enclosure Council. Um, and there's definitely one in Philadelphia. There's definitely one in Oakland. So um, these exist. And it's really, I would suggest that NOR would have always some uh, contribution to that, to be there, to put your ear to the ground to hear what's going on. And, and just as importantly, what's often missing there is to hear the architects concerns and questions. So there's a lot of building science consultants go to these, a lot of building product manufacturers, but um, in, in Ontario in particular, we don't have that many architects coming. And I think they would benefit from hearing the architects views and concerns. Uh, another question from David Cluzio. Uh, does passive house standards make sense in the Canadian climate for towers? Ooh, that's a loaded question. Um, so I, I partly, I'll, I'll just put this, I'll say this. Depends what you mean by passive house standards. Um, if you were to say, does it make sense to have a very airtight thermal bridge free building enclosure with excellent windows that concerns itself with thermal comfort I think that absolutely not only makes sense for Canadian tires, towers of residential type, it's the, it should be the standard of what we aim for. Now, when you, if you mean passive house standards, if you mean the German organization that set up a bunch of rules for townhouses in Darmstadt, well, not always. In fact, and that's why that organization and the US spinoff, which responded to that sort of brittle set of rules, um, why they're changing and they're trying to adapt their standards. So I, I guess I would say the concept of, a, of, of passive house for residential towers totally makes sense, uh, should be what we strive for. Um, but do all of the exact rules that they apply uh, fit into a tower in Mississauga? Probably not. Uh, next question is from Cole. Hey, John, great presentation. Towards the beginning, you mentioned new products for moisture, air, water control, and the claims that these products make. What can or should we look for to verify these claims, assuming that the literature provided by the manufacturer won't be forthcoming with any faults? <laughs> for example, there was research done by your firm on the cladding attachment products for thermal bridging. The end result was that the, the, these purpose-built products with newer materials like fiberglass were beat by simple wood strapping, fastened to stainless steel screws, nails, et cetera. Well, um, that's, again, that's a big picture question. But you're, first of all, I think I would say, I would agree with you that you can't presume that limitations and faults are going to be spelled out in the brochure. Now, good product manufacturers, and maybe more importantly, good sales reps, will one-on-one -on -one tell you about, well, that's probably not appropriate for this project, et cetera. But that said, as the agent of the owner, the architect does have to be on guard against the unscrupulous or the uninformed about whether or not that product works. And so looking for um, third-party verification is good. 
Uh, also asking around amongst the contractors and subtrades, who's used it? Has it worked out for you? Because again, I'm, I'm a big believer in gaining field experience and it's too easy for us to stick in our offices in front of our laptops when in fact there may be somebody out there who has actually used it. Uh, and so trying to get them. And then the last thing I'd say, um, I um, would encourage people to use new products, but use them in non-critical ways. Use them on the ground floor, use them below the front entrance canopy, and then go back and check on your project and find out how it worked. Um, the challenge is, is when you use a, a product which you or the design or the construction team has little experience on and using it for an entire 700,000 square foot building, that's when I get very nervous. Uh, and so, but that means to break that, you need to try it out, but on smaller, less critical areas. And on the exact example you use, the fiberglass clip versus the stainless steel screw, there's no doubt that the stainless steel screw and furring strip can replace the fiberglass clip, but there are limits as well to um, not just the fiberglass clip, but the stainless steel clip versus the screw. So you have, because in their subtleties, I can't install the screw and then check that I didn't tear the uh, WRB. Whereas if I have a simple stainless steel Z clip, I can put a screw in and I can wander by and someone can check that it was done right. With the furring strip and screw, you are trusting that they hit it on the first try and they didn't put three holes in and then put it in. And so that kind of subtlety might say, I still want to do the more expensive fiberglass clip or the Z clip out of stainless steel. So as I'm not, I don't think anyone on this call would be surprised. I mean, there's often, you know, small things that matter about a choice of one product or another. Uh, next question is from John Kulos. Uh, so he called us, called us out for liking all glass walls. Uh, what techniques uh, are you seeing to increase the thermal performance of walls uh, that you can see through? Okay. Um, well, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I called out us, so maybe I called out you, but uh, <laughs> I don't know how many, uh, but I agree. It's, it's not an uncommon feel. So first of all, um, all being able to see through a wall, we know the answer to how to make that a thermally uh, good performer in cold weather. You just, uh, but you don't want to spend the money, but the answer is you need more layers, okay? It's like, if you want to do better than double glaze, which is pretty shitty, you want to go to triple glaze. And triple glaze is okay. It's actually not bad, although you probably want to go to quadruple in the new world of, of both enhanced thermal comfort and energy. But that doesn't solve the problem because quadruple still has a summertime problem. And that means also in Glasgow. And so frankly, in Glasgow, they use exterior shades more than they do in Edmonton. Uh, but um, so now you have to also add exterior shades. So that is a solution. And we don't have to develop new ones. It's just that owners don't like the $150 a square foot or $1,700 a square meter price tag. And so they, what ends up happening is people do all glass on the cheap, and then they're pretty horrible, both from a comfort point of view and from an energy environmental point of view. So we have some answers. Technically, we can pull out all the stops and I can show you, we've built prototype buildings in this part of Canada using quintuple glazing with operable exterior and interior shades that meet all the requirements, but who wants to pay for it? And yet, the, the, I showed you an example of 11 Hoyt Street, which is a precast building with punched windows, which I can build for a lot less money. And it, 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 it just outperforms everything else because it doesn't have so many windows that I can afford to have blinds and triple glazing is not expensive per, because it's not a lot of square feet. So the, the, the really, the, the challenge is, is that how do we get affordable, more affordable, uh, all glass facades. And the, the short answer has been, well, we, I don't know. I, I haven't found really, uh, there's tricks that you can do to save money on a per project basis, but they're not enough to really be a category killer and, and, and generate R10 building enclosures at under $100 a square foot. Never, I've never found anything like that. And I just don't think that the technology could be easily found because it just, we, it's so, 
high tech to do it. Uh, another question from David, uh, building BVP is a recent trend and it generates heat. Are you familiar with any issues or do you have any advice? So uh, building integrated uh, photovoltaics, I'm wondering if that's what David means. Uh, so, um, or what is it, what BVP? Hmm. I, I'm thinking of building integrated PV, which are solar panels that you can use as cladding. Um, they absolutely, uh, it's not hard to solve that problem. Okay, just first, first answer. Um, you basically just need a larger air cavity behind them if you're worried about heat gain. Um, because the cavities we use to deal with rain uh, and drying can be modest in size, let's say under 25 millimeter one inch. But for removing heat, you need rather large openings. And then those large openings cause problems for animal infestation. Uh, you lose small children in them. Uh, Spider-Man uses them to climb up your building. And so those types of problems are, are generated but you don't need a large cavity if you're putting it over a reasonable amount of like rock wall type insulation, which is what we're doing. And we actually have a, an expert here at UW we've recently hired who does nothing but BIPV and we're doing some me field measurements of temperature and uh, research into the role of how to keep the temperatures in happy space. Uh, last question, I think uh, it's from Eric. So it's related to barriers. Uh, and is it better to be explicit about the vapor barrier versus vapor retarder distinction, or at least err on the side of the retarder as one could argue that even a barrier is a type of retarder? Shouldn't we detail without AVB or air vapor barriers in mind, instead use AVB, VR, air, air barrier vapor retarders? So the vapor retarder, actually, believe it or not, comes out of a law case that, the term vapor retarder, comes out of a law case that um, deemed that because somebody called it a barrier and it still allowed water vapor to go through, it didn't meet the ASTM standard. And so they actually created the term vapor retarder to be more precise. But um, that said, there are times and places where you want a actual barrier, very low perm, product, such as in the perfect wall. There's no disadvantage to it. In fact, there's only advantages to it in the perfect wall. Vapor retarder, uh, meaning something that's more vapor open than some sort of a barrier, uh, but a little bit indistinct as to what that means, is really only we're using that in specific applications where the vapor control layer is actually on the wrong side, where we're trying to allow some inward drying or some outward drying while also managing condensation. So it's actually very narrow of, a, of an application. And I would be more worried about not having the water air vapor barrier labeled than I would be about whether it's a vapor barrier or vapor retarder. Um, that, you know, cause there are applications where you care about the distinction, but there are many, it's not that common. You know, and especially if we follow the new wall systems where all the insulations on the outside, well, then you may as well go to the vapor barrier. You end up with uh, uh, less concerns about material selection and you got more options. Vapor retarder, I worry about that on framed walls with bad insulation in them, which are kind of a dying breed unless you're building wood frame houses. Yeah. Hope I understood that properly. Great, that, that is all the questions that we have. That's great. Thank you, Chad, uh, and thank you everyone for the questions. Um, but I've got one question, John, <laughs> to end this off with. And uh, I'm gonna pick up on the, the legal side because uh, I'm sure that uh, our in-house counsel who's on the line would have probably asked this question. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna ask it and, uh, and, and, and use an example um, uh, to try to draw attention to it. And, and, and you'll appreciate this, uh, it's a number of years ago and a lot of people on the line don't even know this material, but uh, Renaissance stone. Um, there were years and years and years that that material was out on the market and there were, there were a lot of architects that actually used it. And uh, the building failures on Renaissance stone, which was a, a, a concrete um, uh, material that um, virtually disintegrated underwater. I mean, there, 
There are a number of buildings in Toronto that I can uh, rhyme off and, uh, you know, very large firms actually use it and, and I won't mention them. But the, the lawsuits that came out of using uh, Renaissance stone, I, I think went on for, I don't know, 10, maybe 15 years. Um, and, you know, the suppliers kept, you know, selling it and it kept being used, um, nor for, I mean, we were, we were quite strong and we re refused to use the material and we, we told everyone in the office, never use the material and we never actually uh, used it through those years. Uh, but my question is, um, and, and you're involved in, in, in a lot of forensics on buildings and you know, it, it would be interesting for, you know, uh, firms like ours and, and architects as a whole to really be on top of, you know, materials and products that, that, that are not working. Um, is, is there anything through the Building Envelope Council or is there any material that, that is put out to, you know, to, you know, um, out there is to, to alarm the industry when, when materials do fail and, 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 you know, not to, I would say, disclose court cases or anything, but when things go sideways to, you know, notify the industry that, you know, these materials have gone, you know, have gone bad and there have been some bad results and we shouldn't be using them. So I only know of one example of this happening, and that is the Canadian Construction Materials Centre sent mm -hmm. out a notice only a few years ago saying, be very careful of magnesium oxide boards, MGO boards. Um, and uh, CCMC uh, doesn't do this very often because they're a government agency and they need a lot of evidence. And that's actually the reason why it's very difficult for, for, for me or RDH as a firm to say, you know, these materials are kind of dubious, stay away. <laughs> <laughs> because of yeah. course, the moment you do that, you you risk having slander or whatever uh, yeah. suits, um, because you need to have enough evidence to say why. Now, I personally, on a project by project basis, you know, Sylvia, I can tell you, you know, you probably should stay away from that particular product because we've seen it fail, and um, and that's actually, unfortunately, the best we have. And I wish we had something more like the the Federal Aviation Association uh, of Aviation Administration, where every time there's a, a, an accident or a near accident, you have to report it to a central repository. So literally, if an airplane has to brake aggressively to avoid a tow truck on the runway, there's a report made. Um, we have like failures that I know completely know about and are even publicly available that are, there's no way to distribute that information. So I showed you the Viking Stadiums in Minneapolis. You know, it's a $1.1 billion building. They ended up removing essentially all of the cladding and putting it back on again. And how many people know about it? You know, it's, it's yeah. boggling yeah. that we don't have a better mechanism. So going to the Building Enclosure Council, you get it over the bar. You get it on scuttlebutt. You get it on, you know, kind of conversations. You don't get it yeah. in any kind of formal way. Like I yeah. think we would all like to see a bit more of. Yeah, but you remember my case with the the Renaissance Stone. It went on for years, and they they usually do. They usually do, Silvio. They go on for years, and you know, because again, and partly it's because it does. It's not like this. The product Renaissance Stone just disintegrated. It's when you said when you expose it to water for long periods of time, it disintegrated, and so the question then becomes an argument. So should you be like should you be exposing it to that much water? Aren't you a bad architect for making the cladding get wet? Which of course seems like a bit of a ludicrous statement, but it, you know you could you know with the right lawyers you could drag that kind of comment out for a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's unfortunate, um, John. That was an excellent presentation. I think that the uh, questions were uh, uh, were great, great questions. Um, wish we had more time, but as you said at the beginning, you could have made this into a six-hour presentation. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure that it would have been just as interesting as the, the, the one hour presentation. So um, on behalf of Nor Ed, um, I want to thank you very much for this one. And we'll definitely would love to have you back um, uh, another time. So thank you for uh, the presentation, John. My pleasure. I'm glad Nor's doing this. And thanks for letting you, Waterloo, come along for the ride. So that's good. I, I, you're doing something really good here. Thank you very much. Thank you all and um, 
look forward to uh, the next one in, um, in November uh, with uh, Carlo Ratti and uh, hope to have everyone uh, back then. Uh, thank you and uh, goodbye for now. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye now.